tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Very troubling uh, that these happen. They're random and unprovoked. A random punching spree in the downtown core. Why police believe there may be more victims. Also, a pedestrian has died after a hit and run in Burnaby. Now the hunt for a semi-truck and... 75 years ago, Canadians landed on this beach. A turning point in the Second World War. My dad never spoke of the war. Coming here makes you understand what they went through. The emotional tributes on the anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We're learning more details tonight about a plea put out yesterday by Vancouver police to help find a man. It's because investigators say he has breached the terms of an unprecedented court order relating to his health and potentially the health of others. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, who is this man? He's 35-year-old David Hind. Last October, Hind pleaded guilty to violating BC's Public Health Act, becoming the first person doctors have ever used the courts against to force someone into treatment for HIV, the virus that causes AIDS. Now, health officials say they worked with local care providers to try to force Hine to comply with health orders and only went to the courts as a last resort. He did agree to take medication, go to clinic appointments, and wear a condom during sex. Now, court documents CBC has obtained say he was allegedly late for appointments and changed his home without telling a health officer, among other things. This is 35-year-old David Hind. He's six foot three, 195 pounds, with brown eyes, and now a shaved head. He's known to be downtown Vancouver frequently and may be driving a black Dodge Ram with Alberta license plates. Police have been trying to find him for a month. There are issues of privacy uh, surrounding this, but there's also uh, the, the biggest issue for us right now is that this is a wanted uh, man with a valid uh, BC-wide warrant for his arrest for six counts of breach of probation. Now, public health officials have agonized over David Hines' case for years as they didn't want to be seen as criminalizing HIV or contributing to any stigma around it. Still, they say they only went to the courts as a last resort. You can find more on this story on our website, and we'll have more at 11, cbc.ca slash bc. Okay, Dan, thank you. A 75-year-old man is dead after a hit and run in Burnaby this morning. Witnesses tell police the man was crossing the street when he was hit by a semi-truck driving east on Marine Way near Boundary. It appears he was not in a marked crosswalk when the crash happened. The driver of the semi apparently stopped briefly before driving off, and now investigators are trying to track the vehicle down. They say it was pulling a dark red shipping container. Anyone with information about what happened or anyone who has dash cam footage from the area is asked to contact Burnaby RCMP. Well, a man has been charged after a brutal punching spree on at least five random people in Vancouver's downtown core. And as the CBC's Tina Lovegreen reports, officers think there could be more victims they haven't heard from. Imagine this, you're walking down this sidewalk. It's a weekday. Maybe you're going home from work or from a dinner when suddenly someone randomly punches you in the face. Well, that's exactly what Vancouver police say happened to at least five people right outside Waterfront Station last week. Very troubling uh, that these happen. They're random and unprovoked. Uh, and fortunately, no one was seriously physically injured, but it's still a, a very hard thing to take emotionally, or it can be. First responders treated all the victims for minor injuries right here on the scene, but one man was badly hurt. And a 37-year-old uh, Burnaby man was transported to hospital for an assessment and observation. He was released later. With the help of several Good Samaritans, police were able to track down a suspect and arrest him just over on Richards and West Pender, 32-year-old Stuart Schneider from Vancouver. Schneider has been charged with three counts of assault, one count of assault causing bodily harm, and one count of robbery, and he remains in custody. It's not Schneider's first run-in with police, Previously, he was found guilty of trespassing and was charged for various offenses, including uttering threats and possessing a weapon for dangerous purpose. And just 11 days before the alleged assault, he was found guilty after someone feared he would hurt them. But why exactly five people were punched in the face here on May 28th is still under investigation. Meanwhile, police want to hear from anyone who may have information 
because they do believe there are more people who may have been assaulted. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. To Vancouver Island now, where a 58-year-old man is in a medically induced coma after an attack that left him with serious head injuries. Jody Williams was assaulted May 27th after he confronted two men who were allegedly urinating off Pier 66 in Cowichan Bay. One of the men allegedly hit Williams in the head, who then hit his head again when he fell to the ground. He was airlifted to hospital in Victoria, where surgeons removed a piece of his skull as well as a section of his left frontal lobe. Williams is expected to be in a coma for seven to ten days, but his family says he could be in the hospital for up to a year recovering. Friends are fundraising to help William's partner visit him. Uh, Jody is not a violent person. He's not an angry person. So to hear that uh, he was attacked in such a way has been very shocking um, and has been heartbreaking. Two men were arrested at the scene. They have since been released from custody, and so far, no charges have been laid. A Victoria doctor has been suspended for two months after breaching conditions on his practice. Dr. Daniel Archie Bowie admitted back in 2008 to unprofessional conduct with a female patient. Bowie has been working at Uptown Medical Clinic at 3640 Saanich Road, but he failed to notify the College of Physicians and Surgeons that he moved his practice. The college's decision also notes Bowie was not displaying any signs telling patients that he was a, that a chaperone was required for sensitive examinations of female patients, and he did not notify staff of the conditions attached to his practice. The two-month suspension began on June 1st. Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou's extradition hearing will begin more than a year after she was taken into custody. BC Supreme Court accepting a proposal from Meng's defense team to start on January 20th of next year. Meng wasn't in court today. The 47-year-old is charged, along with the company, with 13 counts of conspiracy, fraud, and obstruction in the United States. The U.S. is seeking to have her extradited on allegations she and the company violated sanctions against dealing with Iran, allegations Huawei is calling baseless. This is an abuse of Canada's extradition process and a serious violation of her rights. Ms. Meng's lawyers believe the U.S. campaign against Huawei and the comments made by the President of the United States demonstrate that this case was guided for political and financial considerations, not the rule of law. Huawei's spokesman says since Canada doesn't impose sanctions on Iran, she has broken no Canadian laws and must be released. Both Meng and the company have denied any wrongdoing. And you can find every episode of our podcast, Sanctioned, the Arrest of a Telecom Giant, online. Visit cbc.ca slash sanctioned. It's also available on Apple and Google Podcasts. A group of people is calling for the Vancouver Park Board to put an end to artificial turf fields. The group went to Trillium Park and took samples of black rubber pellets and artificial grass. They sent those samples to a lab in Burnaby, and the results came back positive for lead. They are concerned with debris from the field ending up in our water. I find this situation at Trillium Park and all other sports fields that are similar to this very disturbing because here we have pollution that is heading straight towards the drains, towards the fish habitat, going into the food chain. In 2015, Vancouver Coastal Health reviewed studies on artificial turf that uses rubber crumbs and found them to be safe. But earlier this year, the park voted in favor of exploring more sustainable options. It says the fact the group noticed debris in the catch basins means their filtration systems are working properly. Park Board says staff regularly clean out those basins and dispose of anything that's collected. Protesters calling for better protection of old growth forests demonstrated across Canada today as part of a province-wide day of action. 
Uh, these ecosystems are in crisis, and at the same time, the forest industry is in big trouble too. The headlines are dominated by stories of mill closures, of layoffs, and, uh, and ecologically, the, the picture is twice as grim. Uh, if we don't step up, if this government, if John Horgan doesn't step up and protect old growth forests, future premiers aren't going to have an opportunity to do so. The protesters gathered outside the offices of more than a dozen politicians and government officials. They want the province to immediately halt logging in old growth forest areas, and they're calling for the creation of a plan to protect those areas, similar to the one used in the Great Bear Rainforest. That supports First Nations and provides good long-term forestry jobs. Brett is here now with a first look at the forecast. Uh, it's June the, what is it, the 6th, I guess, yeah. And you've got snow somewhere? I know, and it's not even just somewhere. This is like a lot of BC. If you're doing any traveling across some of our interior mountain passes, this is gonna be affecting you tonight into tomorrow morning. And yes, June 6th, special weather statement, up to 10 centimeters of snow is possible by tomorrow morning. So this is, of course, not good news, uh, certainly making travel a little bit dicey. However, this isn't gonna be affecting anyone into the lower mainland specifically. So I'm gonna be touching upon this in the next segment. If you do have any travel, stay tuned for that. What I will be letting you know, though, is how this can be expected to go across. We're looking at specifically the Okanagan uh, connector as our main area, which I'll show you in one second up here. This is going to be connecting anywhere between Merritt and over into Kelowna. There's the chance for this snow to be accumulating, as I said, up to 10 centimeters by tomorrow morning. Now down toward the lower mainland, temperatures are going to be our story for tomorrow. A little bit on the cool side, only hovering around 15 degrees. All right, Brett, thanks very much. You're welcome. Well, this year is the 31st annual Concord Pacific Dragon Boat Festival. To celebrate, they've unveiled a new lightweight boat. Yeah, it took just a year to go from designing the new Dragon Boat to having a prototype and the final build. Festival runs from June 21st to 23rd, admission free, and there will be live performances throughout the weekend. Tributes and respects paid to the fallen on France's Normandy coast today, all to mark the 75th anniversary of D-Day. On June 6, 1944, a surprise sea and air operation turned the tide of the Second World War. Tens of thousands of Allied troops took part, including 14,000 Canadians. The CBC's Thomas Daglow was there for today's ceremonies. Today's Canadian D-Day commemorations put veterans from the Battle of Normandy front and center. Not only did they sit up front and hear their bravery honored, but the most poignant moment of the day may have come at the end of the ceremony when they were invited to return to the beaches, Juneau Beach, where Canadians landed 75 years ago today. In some cases, these veterans had not been back to that beach for 75 years, an emotional moment indeed. Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, told them Canadians won't forget their sacrifices. On the battlefields of Normandy, Francophones, Anglophones, Indigenous peoples, new Canadians came together as one. One fighting force standing on guard for their British, American and French allies. Thousands of Canadians made the trip over to France to be here for today's commemorations. Uh, everyone seemed to have a story, a personal connection to the Battle of Normandy or indeed the Second World War and they were eager to share those stories today. My grandfather, uh, he survived uh, D-Day and he survived throughout the war and he came back to Canada. He was able to come here 10 years ago for the 65th anniversary and it was an incredibly emotional experience for him to be back because it was the first time he was back since the war. And uh, he passed away last year so I got asked to attend on his behalf uh, to, to honor his memory. My dad never spoke of the war, he never said a word, so never really knew much about it. But coming here makes you understand what they went through, whether it was on the beaches of Normandy or in Holland or Belgium or wherever the front was along the front. For me, it's kind of adds closure to what my dad never told us. 
Commemorations continued well into the evening here at Juno Beach at an international ceremony where representatives from every country involved in the Battle of Normandy, including Canada, Britain, the United States and Germany, they all laid wreaths on the beach where each one of those countries fought many years ago. This could be the last time that so many Battle of Normandy veterans returned to France for commemorations. And as someone in the crowd said today, 75 years ago, they had no fear. Today, their only fear is that what happened here is forgotten. Thomas Dagg with CBC News at Juneau Beach. Now, a few kilometers away from Juneau at Omaha Beach, there was a ceremony at the U.S. War Cemetery. This time, it was U.S. President Donald Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron who spoke to the veterans there. We know what we owe to you veterans, our freedom. On behalf of my nation, I just want to say thank you. Today we remember Donald Trump also spoke to the veterans, telling them they are among the very greatest Americans who will ever live. After the speech, Macron awarded five U.S. veterans with the Legion of Honor, France's highest award of merit. He embraced each man as he did so. Here in Canada, ceremonies were held all across the country today, marking the 75th anniversary of D-Day. But this year, the main commemoration was not held at the National War Memorial in Ottawa. Instead, it was held on the East Coast in Halifax. The CBC's Brett Ruskin explains why. Well, this was another commemoration ceremony here, the largest ceremony on Canadian soil to remember the largest seaborne invasion in history. And so it happened here in Halifax, where so many Canadians traveled to from coast to coast, taking trains here seven decades ago to arrive here in Halifax to board ships and head overseas to war. And to signify and represent that journey, there were boots, military boots that traveled on trains, in fact, the furthest coming from Vancouver, but another 10 pairs or so coming from all across the country. Uh, they came here to uh, represent that transit that many soldiers make made to come here to Halifax to board ships and head overseas. Now, there were so many poignant moments in this ceremony. Here's just a few of them. And we must remember the lives that were lost, the bodies that were wounded. But first and foremost, we must remember that working together is our hope for the future. And there was one point where one of the veterans, in fact, read the act of remembrance. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. In the historical records that I've Look, Dad, we had 126 men that joined and two women. We lost five. And now as this ceremony wraps up, this is likely one of the largest and last major ceremonies uh, marking the anniversary of D-Day in which there will still be veterans alive. And so the task now is for the next generation to ensure that this story, that this account of what happens now moves from living memory to the pages of history. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. We've already talked about it, but it's pretty shocking that there's going to be snow in June. Red. I mean, even for me, I like BC has taught me so many things. You can have whatever weather you want, just wherever you want to go in the province. You can go <laughs> to the mountains, get snow. You can go to the coast, have some beautiful surfing it's conditions. True. It's amazing, really. But yeah, this is definitely the shocker. So for traveling, as I mentioned earlier, this is not the night to be doing it. Um, but certainly on this side of the world, in actual downtown Vancouver, conditions are actually going to be a little bit variable. If you look at what's going on, or what rather went on this morning, we had a 
a whole lot happening. We actually had some sun, and look at that, even a sun shower. That's some showers that you saw right onto the webcam there. Then it got nice, then we've had some more clouds built in. I mean, it was just a very variable day. This is how it goes sometimes. This is getting into the transition into full on summertime. But that said, this, this is not really summertime news. So again, I just wanted to reiterate, if anyone's doing traveling into our mountain passes, specifically on the Okanagan Connector or the Coquihalla, be aware. And of course, even into the BC Peace region, this is gonna be something to mind. Now, when we're talking about our precipitation story across the province, this is what's going on. We have a large area of low pressure centered over the whole region. This is in fact bringing up to 10 centimeters of snow for both Banff and Jasper. So there are snowfall warnings, if you can believe it, in early June on the Alberta side of things. But everything is looking a little unsettled as we go through Friday. However, there is some good news in terms of how this is gonna be affecting us as we get into the weekend. First and foremost though, cooler temperatures widespread across the province. These are anywhere between five to 10 degrees below seasonal as we get into the weekend. And for here, this is Friday, what I wanted to mention across the region, we are expecting a few showers, especially say around Coquitlam and into the morning hours, this could be going all the way into the Fraser Valley, but there is the risk for an embedded thunderstorm here as well. So something just to keep in mind, but what we're gonna be dealing with into the next few days, we've got an improving situation. So we've got a few kind of cooler days. I don't wanna call it chilly per se, but a little bit below seasonal, that slight risk for showers is gonna be there both for Friday and Saturday, but Sunday onward, I'll break it to you right now. The news is looking great. We've got a lot of sunshine in the forecast and temperatures right back where they should be in terms of seasonal. So got a nice balance of that much needed moisture for the moisture rather for the ground and the nice sun conditions for us. Looking forward to next week. Thanks, Brett. You're welcome. Well, it is one of our city's newest performance and rehearsal spaces for dancers. Tonight in our series, The Fine Art of Survival, we take you inside Boombox to meet some of the dancers who work and create inside. Boombox is, uh, originally it was gonna be our rehearsal space uh, because we, we were sick of renting studio space in Vancouver, paying 25, 30 bucks an hour doubles as a performance venue and a rehearsal space um, and being able to make the work in the same place that's being performed is really important and kind of changes the practice a lot. It's like the size of a normal dance studio just in a different shape. When we have artists working in here we give them the space for free but uh, because we don't want it to come out of their pocket. Often you're having to go into a studio and, and pay large sums of money to, to make all your material and then you have you know a day to get into a theater and perform. Whereas here, we're, we're basically creating and performing in the same space, um, and so it all sort of ties into one another. It kind of feels like a different, uh, a different way of working. And of course, it's smaller, um, there's different limitations, but there's also this extreme perspective that's played with, so it opens up a lot of possibilities. The sense that this is a community space is also really great because it's, it means that people are accessing it and passing by each other and that it's, it's a shared, um, the shared space for us to, to meet at. Is this a legal space? From what I know, we are in a gray area. We're in a gray zone. We're floating in a gray zone because we're not even on the ground. I believe the city's role with boombox and spaces like it should be um, just not shutting it down. Of course, some funding would be nice, but I think the most important thing is just no the city knowing that um, respectful distance, that they stuff like this is gonna happen in a city. You know, part of the reason why I'm here is not just financially to have free space, it's to, um, to see something grow and to work differently and to find a different way of putting dance on. I think dance should exist anywhere and everywhere and, and in boxes and industrial zones. Um, it, it doesn't matter. I think we have to kind of get behind these types of initiatives different for sure have the to check it out maybe shipping container wow very cool gotta do what you gotta do Here you go yep. <laughs> drastic measures are being taken in saskatchewan affecting a beloved landmark yes it's all in an effort to reclaim a coveted international title i recognize that mac the moose moose jaws famous statue undergoing a a bit of surgery, its antlers are being removed to make way for a bigger set so it can reclaim the record for world's tallest moose statue. Mac held the title for 31 <laughs> years until this shiny metal moose was erected in Norway in 2015. Mac's new antlers and new height record should be in place by September. That, uh, that one in Norway is quite the moose. Quite the moose, yes.
We've got to have, you got to go get the record for sure. Keep get, it that in rec Canada. get that record back for sure. Uh, that's it for us on Facebook Live. We're going to be back uh, after tonight's uh, hockey game. And Dan will be here at 11 as well. Mm -hmm. Have a good night. Thanks for watching.